The North Star was a guide to freedom for African Americans fleeing the darkness of slavery. Then and now, the North Star State has been the destination for those seeking a better place. From small town to city. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement. For two centuries, African Americans have made a home. And worked to make a change in Minnesota. These are some of the stories of Minnesota's black pioneers. Support for North Star, Minnesota's Black Pioneers, is provided in part by St. Paul Travelers, providing property and casualty insurance products and services for businesses and individuals. And by Jostens, because life is a circle filled with starts and finishes, beginnings and endings. For over a century, Jostens has helped people celebrate, reward, and remember the greatest moments of their lives. Support for North Star is also made possible by Otto Bremer Foundation, Stairstep Foundation, RBC Dane Rauscher, General Mills Foundation, Archie D. and Bertha H. Walker Foundation, West, a Thompson business, and Education Minnesota's Foundation for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, with additional funding by Education partners for North Star include Minneapolis Public Schools, Northwest Suburban Integration School District, West Metro Education Program, and East Metro Integration District. It was the spring of 1857. I was accompanied by my husband's cousin and his bride. They intended to settle in Minneapolis, quite a small village located on the west bank of the Mississippi, opposite the city of St. Anthony. A black pioneer named Emily Gray and her family came upriver and made a home near the falls of St. Anthony. This mother and businesswoman also made a stand against slavery on the eve of the Civil War when the Minnesota Territory was becoming the North Star State. African Americans were here during the formal territorial period. You'd find black people providing barber shops, tailors, other sorts of things that catered to personal needs, uh, personal grooming. The only job that African American men could fill that would give them the, the possibility of a, of a future in economic uh, mobility, economic, socially, was barbering. The whole spirit of civil rights was kept alive in the barbershops of St. Paul. One of these African-American barbers was Joseph Farr. Late in life, Farr recalled how this black community made up a small stop on the Underground Railroad. I think there must have been 50 or 60 colored people here in 1850, and they all were concerned in getting the slaves away from their owners. Another black barber, Ralph Gray, was working upriver in St. Anthony. In 1857, he had established his business and sent for his wife. Emily Gray's memoirs describe the journey west from Pennsylvania. We were delayed upon the road by high waters through Wisconsin. Our train was brought to a sudden stop and could proceed no further. The best of humor prevailed. Whenever could be heard the patter of rain upon the roof of the coach, it was the signal to sing a hymn or a ditty. Everyone joined in the singing. This seemed to be intended to lessen the noise of the downpour of rain as well as to chase away from our minds the gloomy reflections of separation from old homes and friends. Every person we came in contact with seemed to be doing his utmost to make it as pleasant as could be for us. Emily felt welcomed in Minnesota. Many of the area's leaders were anti-slavery. This was the time when the territory was preparing for statehood, and Minnesota's abolitionist Republicans vowed to wield the power of the new state on the side of freedom. 
My husband had selected a spot with a small building for us to take up our residence. Fashionable and formal visits were not much in vogue, but the good old-time neighborly calls were more generally indulged in. Suggestions in domestic economy, new methods of bread making and vegetable cooking were learned. There was always some woman friend who would gladly be a guiding star to lead me out of the many little difficulties met with in all households. Local women taught her how to cook Minnesota style and they also taught her how to sew. So it was the women here who actually led to her own seamstress business later on. She was very concerned about the institution of slavery and actually went shopping for churches that would deal with the institution of slavery, settling at last on the Congregational Church. What made this church interesting to her was the minister, Reverend Seacom. His mouth was not muzzled in the pulpit when occasion required he should speak against the national crime of American slavery. She took pride in being African American. She came from a family that was very involved in, in abolition and helping slaves uh, gain their freedom. She named her son, who would be the first black child to be born in St. Anthony, Minnesota, Toussaint Louverture, after the, the Haitian general who led the, uh, the slaves in revolt against the French. But Minnesota of the 1850s was as prejudiced as it was progressive. In 1854, St. Paul-based territorial legislators almost passed a so-called black law. The bill would have required African Americans arriving in Minnesota to post a bond of several hundred dollars to guarantee good conduct. Intolerant Northerners weren't the only problem. In the mid-1850s, Southern settlers tried but failed to establish plantations complete with slaves here in Minnesota. The area also played a role in the most important legal decision of the era. Two decades before Emily's arrival, a slave named Dred Scott was brought to Fort Snelling. After having spent time in the free territory, Scott sued for his freedom. In 1857, after years of court battles, he lost his case in a landmark decision. The court decided that uh, Dred Scott was not free. You are property and therefore you can't possibly be a citizen, therefore you have no rights to petition, we won't hear it. End of story. Slave masters felt because of the protection of Dred Scott that they could come to Minnesota and bring their slaves. And they were coming to Minnesota because this was a place of respite. They could get away from the summer in the South. So the free state of Minnesota was bound to the business of slave owning tourists. This tension would boil over when Christmas came to Minnesota in July. Colonel Richard Christmas traveled upriver in the summer of 1860 to the new state of Minnesota. Like most well-to-do visitors, the Mississippi planter and his family stayed at St. Anthony's Winslow House. Christmas brought along a slave named Eliza Winston. Eliza Winston got word to, to Emily Gray asking for help for freedom. Emily Gray was a woman who was willing to um, say, this is the time to act. In fact, she rode with the posse out to meet with the Christmas family and spirited Eliza Winston to court where due process was ready to free her. In a tense, packed courtroom, an abolitionist judge granted Winston her freedom. Regarding the loss of his slave, Colonel Christmas was quoted as saying, I have plenty more in Mississippi, but slavery supporting Minnesotans weren't as calm. A mob was forming. There are a lot of people here who did not like abolitionists. There are a lot of people here who did not want to see slaves freed. Winston was taken to the home of W.D. Babbitt. Abolitionist editor Jane Swisshelm offers a dramatic account of what followed. The house of William D. Babbitt in Minneapolis was surrounded from midnight until morning by a howling mob, stoning it, firing guns and pistols, attempting to force doors and windows, and only prevented gaining entrance by the solidity of the building and the bravery of its defense. Baby Toussaint and the family also came under siege when the mob stormed the Gray's home and ransacked it. So it was a very turbulent time, and for a woman 
to take a stand against slavery at a time where the local economy relied on the preservation of slavery. It was very, very impressive. St. Anthony was divided, and for the next several months, the residents of St. Anthony and Minneapolis, both, uh, walked around with guns. Uh, the, the, the Twin Cities were virtually on the throes of civil war. And this is ironic because just a couple months later, civil war, in fact, would be declared. Minnesota was the first state to offer troops for the fight to preserve the Union. At the decisive victory of Gettysburg, a Minnesota infantryman captured a Virginia Confederate battle flag. Another victory followed the war. After several attempts, a referendum was finally passed, granting the right to vote to Minnesota's African Americans. This was in 1868, two years before the nation would take this step with the 15th Amendment. This Minnesota milestone was celebrated with a grand event in St. Paul, where Ralph Gray read Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Emily and Ralph continued to be quiet community leaders who delighted in the steady growth of the state's black population by the turn of the century. While Toussaint Louverture Gray died when he was a boy, the Gray's other children did well for themselves. The family's descendants are now back on the East Coast. But Emily and Ralph remained. The black pioneer couple are buried next to two of their children in Lakewood Cemetery. Oddly, the graves are unmarked, but in a way, Emily's memoir serves as a poignant epitaph to her life and times. The journal concludes with a powerful ode to the falls of St. Anthony. We never more will hear the music of the falls. Many the times in the quietness of twilight hours when I croon the lullaby over the wearied limbs and sleepy eyes of my children I was joined in the chorus by the plaintive tones of the music of St. Anthony Falls, now gone, gone forever. The falls are now covered by a man-made ramp. The town of St. Anthony is now just a neighborhood in Minneapolis. Many things have changed since the dramatic events of 1860, but some things have transcended time. Despite demands from Virginia, Minnesota refused to return the captured Confederate flag. Why hold on to a tattered standard from a distant war? Maybe, by keeping it, the flag joined other symbols of the young state that was the first to enter the fight on the side of freedom and is still struggling to keep alive Emily Gray's idea of a diverse, accepting Minnesota. Civility and kindness seemed to be in the air in those good old pioneer days. There was never a moment in my life when I regretted that my feet had touched the soil of Minnesota. Another big part of our life was ice skating on Lake Alice. Dirty below, you still went ice skating. Selling her uh, sweet corn and Did you? vegetables, yeah. right? Yeah. To most, these are the voices of small town Minnesota, but to many, these voices and stories don't go with these faces. Meet the Tates. Although they live in urban America now, these are the children of rural Minnesota, part of the unique African-American history of Fergus Falls. The story of blacks and Fergus is a story about the strengths and weaknesses of small town America and of achieving despite obstacles. The story begins in 1862 when Union troops in Tennessee found a new recruit, an African-American boy named Prince Albert Honeycutt. He was about 10 years old. He became a mess boy for a man named Captain Compton. And James Compton was originally from Meadville, Pennsylvania. Prince lived with the captain after the war. When Compton and his family relocated to West Central Minnesota, his young black protege came along. In Fergus Falls, they found a town that had been established in the early 1870s when a sawmill was built on the Otter Tail River. Prince quickly found work. He worked as a teamster. He worked for Henry Page at his flour mill. He was a volunteer firefighter. He started a baseball team called the North Star Club. In 1882, that's when he started his barber shop. Prince seemed to fit in. It said he even spoke fluent Norwegian, but the small town had plenty of small minds. 
then things took a, a turn down. And that's because he married a white woman. He married a woman named Lena Marston. The news of the interracial marriage spread throughout the state, and some reactions were stronger than others. The girl belongs to a respectable family in this county, and the marriage bells strike upon their ears like a death knell. All's well that ends well, but we fear the principals to this affair will not live long enough to witness the end of this foolish step. The race violence implied in this threat didn't happen, but ironically and sadly, the letter did predict the couple's short life together. After four years of marriage, Lena died in childbirth. One year later, he remarried, and this time he married a, a black woman and had a mother for his children. Her name was Nancy Ann Brown. Prince's daughters both graduated from high school in Fergus Falls and then went up to Moorhead to attend the normal school and became teachers. In 1896, he ran for mayor of Fergus Falls. He did not win the election, but he, he ran a good campaign. He had a lot of respect. Prince's leadership would be needed when this small town faced big changes. We had 18 families, so approximately 85 people, that moved to Fergus Falls in one day. How did a trainload of black folks from Kentucky end up in Fergus Falls? In 1896, the Grand Army of the Republic had their annual encampment in St. Paul. Men from Fergus saw an opportunity. There were veterans in Fergus Falls, and they got a bright idea that they would take real estate brochures down to this event and see who they could draw up to Ottertail County. Their sales pitch to veterans of the Army's colored troops worked, and African Americans from Kentucky packed up their lives and came north. Unfortunately for the newcomers, the homesteads they were anticipating were less than ideal. Just a few of the families were able to make a living on farms. Most were thrown into the local labor market. Ads were placed in the paper, you know, if you have any jobs, contact Prince Honeycutt. Prince Albert Honeycutt went from being the only black in Fergus Falls to playing a part in the town's black population becoming the largest outside the Twin Cities. But like the racist reaction to his first marriage, he saw his hometown's dark side again with the resurgence of the Klan in the 20s. It's sad and ironic that he had lived long enough to see two crosses burned in Fergus Falls. That must have been really disheartening. And he didn't live long after that happened. The year 1919 is infamous for the deadly race violence that ripped through northern cities. But in that year, it was a natural disaster that tore through Fergus Falls. That was the year that a very serious tornado destroyed about two-thirds of the town. Our times hit Fergus Falls in the wake of the Twister and through the Depression. Work became scarce. Like many rural Minnesotans, Fergus Falls black residents had to look to the state's big cities for jobs. Eventually, only one African-American family remained. The Tate family. They were great pioneers. These are the grandchildren of African-American settler Harding Tate, whose son David was just a toddler when they arrived. Dad came from Kentucky when he was uh, about uh, 18 months old. David Tate grew up in Fergus and eventually found work in the local dairy. And he was a, a uh, it was very high up in the union and was well respected. His wife, she was the first, but probably the only African American nurse at the state hospital. We feel blessed that my mother and dad decided to stay in Fergus Falls and not make the exit that so many of the other blacks made. There's certainly a lot of good memories, but there's another side too that, um, at least for me, I remember some loneliness. I was a quarterback on the football team and I was president of the freshman class and so forth. But I also didn't have a date for the senior prom. Well, I got in more fights by the time I was 12 or 15 uh, because of white guys who were bigger than I was calling me nigger. At a young age, I always remember my dad saying, uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And uh, I think that helped me a lot. But I've always enjoyed Fergus. 
If I had it to do over, I would go back to Fergus. I would too. Think of Daddy, he'd go to work. What? Three jobs, seven days a week, and I, I'd never see him because he was always at work. They, they sacrificed a lot, I think, for, for us. While there were challenges to being black in Fergus Falls, the Tates think good things will grow from their small town roots. All of our children and grandchildren really, really respect the learning that we had as children. So we've been taught well, and hopefully our children are being taught well. I have one son, Mike, who's the oldest, and then uh, three girls, and they used to go to Fergus Falls during Easter vacation every year. And every year, Michael would say, Mama, please don't let Grandpa get my hair cut. Please don't let <laughs> He'd go every time with a nice afro, and when he'd come back, he wouldn't have no hair. <laughs> he told me I couldn't wear no afro in Fergus Falls. <laughs> Fergus Falls may not have been the hippest place in Minnesota, but the town did make one very cool contribution to American culture. The Tates had an aunt named Bertha who moved to Minneapolis. She had a son who was a gifted musician. This grandson of a Fergus Falls settler went on to become the Grammy-winning producer known as Jimmy Jam Harris. Jimmy Jam and his flight time producing partner Terry Lewis changed American music as part of the Minneapolis sound led by their friend and collaborator, the artist known as Prince. But it was the pioneer known as Prince that set the stage for this unique piece of African-American history. Today, there's a new wave of diversity in Otatale County. People from Somalia, we also have students from Sudan. And so uh, it's, it's coming full, full circle, it's great. Hopefully these newcomers will find neighbors in small town Minnesota who were raised like the Tates. People are people, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with black, white, green, or red. It's just who people are. Life is good. As a reward for almost 51 years of meritorious service, John Hickman Sr., who has held the position as auditor, has been retired on full pay. In 1924, St. Paul's Black Press announced the retirement of John Hickman. Hickman represented the emergence of Minnesota's African-American community in what F. Scott Fitzgerald called the Jazz Age. But John Hickman's journey to Minnesota was anything but easy. In 1863, a young John Hickman was among a community of African Americans escaping slavery on the Mississippi. The Civil War and Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation offered freedom to those who could find it. Leading this pilgrimage was John's father, Robert Hickman, a rail-splitting slave preacher from Boone County, Missouri. Uh, Reverend Hickman was taught to read by his master for the purposes of, he felt, this call to the ministry. Hickman's wife and children were slaves on another property. Oral history has it that he traveled without permission to see about his sick child. It's what any father would do. In doing that, he broke the laws of the state of Missouri in that he was on the road without a pass. Uh, and the law stated he needed, he had to, had to be lashed. Now on the run, Hickman and other slaves made their way to Hannibal, Missouri. And it was in Hannibal that the raft was built. They put it out on the Mississippi in Hannibal, an improbable journey. It's a complete journey of faith. Adrift on the murky river, the raft was approached by a steamboat. For blacks, the Mississippi represented the extremes of America. Freedom when you could get upriver, the worst of slavery when you were sold downriver. There were as many ships promising people that slaves that they were going to take them north and then got them down in the hold and took them south. Fortunately, this ship was on a mission from Minnesota. Packets were steaming up and down the river to fill war depleted labor ranks in the North Star State. The boat took the family filled raft in tow. The shores of St. Paul and freedom was in sight. But as they neared the levee, white laborers worried about competition for jobs, used angry and intimidating protests to keep the boat from landing. 
the dock workers showed the ugly face of intolerance. But many welcomed the newcomers, contrasting them to the white mob. Hickman and his followers finally disembarked further upriver, near Fort Snelling. In this journey, there was this relationship that started with them. Um, they all called him Uncle Bob. And slaves at this time, because the family could be ripped apart at any time, you created these familial relationships. He decided he was coming back to St. Paul. And I believe that's when they said, well, wherever you go, Uncle Bob, we're going. With the arrival of these freedmen, St. Paul's black population almost doubled. Fielding Combs and others among the small black community did what they could for the newcomers. They even opened up their homes for prayer meetings led by Hickman. This fellowship formed into a congregation that found a name in their journey to Minnesota. They called themselves pilgrims because they made this journey and so it became a natural extension that when they created this church, it would be Pilgrim Baptist Church. Once you understand the history um, and the journey, what they had to come through, it's, it's, it, it means everything. While the Pilgrims now had their own church and the day-to-day -day leadership of Hickman, the ex-slaves and other members did not have total freedom. Although ordained as a slave preacher years before, Hickman was not formally trained, so a white minister officially led the church. It would have been too much like slavery. So to go to the white minister and ask him to, for that spiritual guidance is too much like what they had come up out of. But it took them about 13 years to finally um, become a, a licensed and ordained minister, meaning that he was taking classes all of this time. He was the first uh, licensed uh, preacher by the state of Minnesota, the first black man able to bury you, to marry you, um, uh, to do all of those official duties, and it was recognized by the state. Too many times, I think, when we're looking back at people in history, we want to elevate them, uh, give them heroic status. But I think Reverend Hickman, if you can imagine, to be able to stand in your own congregation in 1877 uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota, in front of your own church, a licensed minister, what, how, how that had to have felt. Now, when I look at the picture of him, of that stained glass, he earned that. There's stripes on his back. I mean, he earned it. It's, it's just amazing. From a symbol of freedom for former slaves, as a center of early activism, to the heights of the civil rights movement, the story of Pilgrim Baptist Church symbolizes the story of St. Paul's black community. Pilgrim was the gathering place, the community place. And certainly in the times that Reverend Hickman landed on the shores of the Mississippi and Minnesota, uh, it was not easy. And the starting the church even in the downtown area of St. Paul was not easy. And Reverend Hickman with his body of members, knowing that, I'm sure within his heart, knowing that he was playing a very important role in the development of blacks in St. Paul. Reflecting upon the events of that period, it was wonderful how rapid the change from the condition of mere chattel to that of free man was accomplished. The seeming ambition of every man to become owner of his own home was encouraged. John Hickman was proud of his father, Reverend Robert Hickman, and the other black settlers of St. Paul. A year before his death, John and other former slaves were interviewed by the WPA. His health is failing, but he vividly recalls the events which prompted the pilgrimage. Upon reflection of his boyhood days, his face brightens, but he soon lapses into silence, retiring with the memories which are so sacred to him alone. Every house has a history. Some of these stories and secrets are darker than others. In the early 30s, this home on Columbus Avenue in South Minneapolis became a symbol of segregation and discrimination. How did Minneapolis get over this kind of overt racism? 
Part of the answer is in this house just blocks away. Lena Smith lived here. This house on Fifth Avenue is on the National Register of Historic Places because it was the home of Minnesota's first African-American female lawyer. Despite race and gender bias, Lena Smith emerged as a surprising leader in the fight for civil rights. Lena Olive Smith was born in 1885 in Lawrence, Kansas. When her father died in 1906, Lena, then 21, led her mother and five siblings to Minneapolis. By moving to Minnesota as an educated black woman, um, she was gonna stand out in some sense anyway. And all her life she made choices, I believe, that did make her stand out. Leaders aren't necessarily born, they're made, and people have to find their path. It seemed very clear to me that she was searching. She was searching for that path. In 1915, this journey led Lena to the business of the American dream. From 1910 to 1920, the black population in Minneapolis increased by over 50%. But the growing community had few neighborhoods to call home due to discrimination. Working in real estate would bring Smith face to face with Minnesota's quiet but firm housing segregation. This might have led to Lena's next career move. She enrolled in law school at what would become William Mitchell College of Law. It just so happened that the school was one floor above her realty offices in the Plymouth building on Hennepin Avenue. She and several men, members of the NAACP, several of them lawyers, went to the Pantages Theater in downtown Minneapolis. And they would not allow black people to, to, to um, be seated on the main floor. They had to be in the balcony. So Lena Smith, along with two other male lawyers, took them to court. She added a count of assault along with her count of discrimination. I figure that means that someone actually had to lay hands on her to get her out of there. The Pantages Theater changed their policy before the case came to trial. This idea that even if you lost the particular legal case, you may have helped make progress against segregation was something that we see throughout Lena Smith's work as a lawyer. In 1921, I received my degree, and in that same year was admitted to practice. During my years of practice, I have kept closely in touch with the economic, civil, and social affairs pertaining to the needs of all groups, especially the underprivileged among the Negroes of Minneapolis. Lena Smith made history as the state's first African-American female attorney. Her emerging style seems suited for the courtroom. By the time she graduates from law school, she is wearing severely tailored suits, mannish in description by some. She's wearing a tie. What the reasons were for that, it's hard to interpret over time. I went to St. Peter's AMA Church, and I remember being about five or six years old, and. I had only seen her hair down once, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, she has beautiful hair, because she always wore it back very tight in a bun, and she wore very severe suits, and she always wore suits. That was her, her style, that was her signature, and when you saw it, you know, you almost immediately say, oh, Lena Smith. Lena was also a leader. She had always been active in the Minneapolis NAACP. In 1930, she became president. In the summer of 1931, Smith's trademark tenacity would be needed in what would become her most visible battle with the entrenched racism in the Twin Cities. Arthur and Edith Lee bought a house in Minneapolis, a few blocks into what was a white neighborhood, with apparently restrictive covenants that you're not supposed to sell to non-whites. I talked with his daughter, Mary Lee Foreman, who said that many of her parents' friends, their black friends, didn't agree with what they were doing, buying a house in that white neighborhood, because they knew there'd be trouble. 
No one wants to live next door to a nigger. In the early 30s, a U of M grad student interviewed black and white Minnesotans about the incident. They're lower than us. Let them keep to themselves. I had sympathy for those white people. He shouldn't have gone there. That's the trouble with these northern Negroes. It's unfortunate that there's a color line, but it's nobody's fault but God's. A group from the neighborhood formed and began talks to try to get Lee to sell back his house. Arthur Lee made clear the irony of denying basic rights to a World War I veteran. Nobody asked me to move out when I was fighting for this country in France. All I want is my home, and I have a right to establish one and live in it. While the white neighbors negotiated by day, they became an ugly mob at night. Thousands of white people began demonstrating in front of their little bungalow. A thousand people. A th you think about a thousand people surrounding your home. A white witness described the dangerous scene. I had wandered about in the rear of the crowd when one of the Negroes appeared. He was jostled about for a few moments and the common cry was lynch him. I called to the Negro to keep a stiff upper lip. The negotiators, the press, and even the Minneapolis mayor all increased the pressure on Lee to leave. Despite his principles, he seemed ready to give in. Backing down in such a high-profile case may have solidified segregation in Minneapolis for years to come. That's where we stepped in. The trouble with our people is they have always turned their face and run. It's time to change about. Smith, an acquaintance of the Lees, took over their case and declared her strong stand to the press. Mr. Lee intends to remain in his present residence. I am president of the Minneapolis branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. We feel the issue goes deeper than his individual case. Many African Americans opposed Smith's line in the sand stance. There was fear for the safety of the Lees. There was fear that this painfully public case might make open-minded whites less so. But Lena Smith wasn't afraid. Most of those people are holding jobs from white people. Some of them were raised in the South and are used to catering to white men. I'm from the West and fearless. I'm used to doing the right thing without regard for myself. She's counseling something different. They are going to stay that the police chief was going to have the police begin enforcing public order. Of course I want peace, but I don't want it at any price. She would go to Floyd Olson, the governor, and ask him to call out the National Guard if these demonstrations continued. That turned the tide. She took on that case and she won. From the New York headquarters, the NAACP applauded her impact on the future. From political participation to challenging police brutality, Lena Smith tirelessly continued to take on injustice in Minnesota. She even took on bigotry on the big screen. D.W. Griffith's contentious classic, The Birth of a Nation. The 1915 landmark film features ugly stereotypes of blacks and glamorizes the Ku Klux Klan. The film was a box office draw for decades, but whenever re-releases came to the Twin Cities, Lena Smith led the fight to limit the film's local run. In stark contrast to the offensive film, the home movies of Lena's extended family present what Lena and others were fighting for, finding a quality of life and home in Minnesota. By fighting in the courts and in the streets, Lena Smith foreshadowed the successful civil rights strategies of the 50s and 60s. She practiced from 1921 until 1966. The day she died, she was late to court and people found she'd had a heart attack, she was at home. So she never stopped once she started. She broke barriers, both because of her color and because of her gender, but also because of her uh, intrepid nature. Well, see, she's part of a group of black people that paved a way, made a way out of no way. She was somebody who was thinking ahead. I, I think she was a visionary. 
Like many women, Lena was lost in history. But in 2001, the Minnesota Black Women Lawyers Network created a committee in the name of Lena Smith, keeping alive her belief in community conscious leadership through law. Today, the home at the center of the storm in 1931 is now just another South Side bungalow. Challenges will remain, but a visit up the street to Park Avenue Methodist Church suggests that the neighborhood that was once weakened by hate is now strengthened by diversity. Thanks in part to the fearless Lena Smith. In 1921, a speedy contraption skidded across the snow-covered fields of Minnesota's Red River Valley. An airplane propeller, car engine, and other parts were cobbled together into one of the first snowmobiles ever built. The man behind the snow sled was Frederick McKinley Jones, an African-American tinkerer turned engineer, whose work would change his hometown of Halleck, Minnesota, and later change the world. He sought knowledge and sought understanding. So, I mean, not only did his, his interest in the world and technology uh, lead to a great career for him, but it also led him down all these different paths. When he was a boy, Fred liked to tinker with his father's pocket watch. Eventually orphaned, Fred turned his tinkering toward early automobiles. Working odd jobs throughout the Midwest, Fred ended up on a large farm in northwestern Minnesota run by Walter Hill, son of empire builder James J. Hill. Here, Fred found work as an engineer, and he found a home in Halleck. The year was 1912. This phenomenal fix-it man kept Halleck up and running in these early days of gas engines and electricity. After fighting in World War I, Fred Jones returned to Halleck and to his lifelong passion for automobiles. At the tracks around the region, Fred would run into a lot of bigoted drivers and race organizers. But all things were equal when the flag was dropped and Fred dominated the area's races. Off the track, Fred's tinkering went beyond cars. His fix-it work was often to help a fellow Halleck resident to meet the need of a neighbor. A local doctor complained to Fred about having to constantly haul aching patients from their rooms to the hospital x-ray station. Fred devised a portable x-ray machine Radio had become a huge part of American life by the 1920s. Fred and a partner created microphones and transmitters. With the advent of talkies, sound was also becoming part of the movies. But the owner of Halleck's Little Gym Theater couldn't afford a new sound system, so he went to Fred for a favor. Halleck's handyman devised a film sound system that was so innovative, it caught the eye of a Minneapolis entrepreneur named Joe Numero. Numero later admitted when a black man entered his office, he thought it was a joke. I'm sure he was surrounded by others who may have at times doubted his ability. Uh, however, I'm sure that there were people who got it and then were able to support him. Numero and Jones started working together. As he did for his neighbors in Halleck, Fred's work was often responding to calls for help and tackling problems that needed solving. In 1938, when his boss asked him to figure out a way to keep food from spoiling during overland transportation, Fred Jones went to work. What he came up with was the world's first system for refrigerated transportation. The technology was applied to trucks and trains in the company Jones and Numero would call Thermo King. Fred Jones made it possible to ship and receive perishables year-round. The supermarket was born. During World War II, Fred adapted the technology for the Army to help bring blood plasma and food to soldiers in the field. His technology that, that started off as a simple thing here in Minnesota ended up saving lives. And while there have always been black scientists and black engineers, their stories have not been in the, in the forefront. And, and so having a, a Fred Jones knowing his story, I think that is incredibly inspiring. Since his death in 1961, Frederick Jones has been recognized as one of America's great inventors and was the first African-American to receive the National Medal of Technology. Fred Jones holds more than 50 patents. Fred posthumously received fame, although he never really gained fortune for all of his work at Thermal King. 
but the fact that his work helped so many, just like his tinkering up in Halleck helped his neighbors, might have made it all right for Fred and his family. His quiet inspiration is another lasting invention. First, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Don't be afraid to work. Second, you have to read. All my life has been study and work. And third, believe in yourself. Duluth, Minnesota, at the point of Lake Superior, has something horrible in its history. After decades of denial, truth came into view, slowly, like an ore ship approaching the Twin Ports Harbor. In 1920, in the midst of a mob of thousands, three black men were brutally lynched in downtown Duluth. Over 80 years later, the same streets were filled with another gathering, this time to reclaim the soul of the city by dealing with the presence of the past. In the early 20th century, Duluth's economy was being forged at the U.S. steel plant. In the face of demands from labor, the company leveled the ever-present threat of replacement workers. In this case, blacks from the cotton fields of the South were lured north with good wages. This gave rise to racial tensions in the port town. But in June of 1920, it wasn't steel workers, but circus workers who would be at the center of a racially charged storm. The John Robinson Circus was in town as part of a tour of the Northland. Jimmy Sullivan and Irene Tuscan had spent the evening at the circus. The couple encountered black workers who were loading circus cars. What happened next is not clear. We know now that there was no sexual assault. But a few hours later, Jimmy called the police and reported that Irene had been raped. The Duluth police hauled half a dozen black circus workers to the city jail on Superior Street. By morning on June 15th, rumors, hate, and hysteria bred the beginnings of a lynch mob. Among the instigators on the west end of town was Louis Dondino. He and a small band drove a truck throughout the neighborhood brandishing a length of rope to incite residents. The mounting mob tension caught the eye of Ed Nichols. In a city of 100,000, he was one of just 400 African-American residents. He told me the first words out of his mouth when he saw that headline was, there's going to be a lynching. He barricaded himself and his family in the home, and he took out a, a pistol. Nichols was right to worry. The mob headed east and ominously gathered in front of the police station. By evening, as darkness fell on Duluth, the mob moved on the jailhouse. The uh, commissioner of public safety, a man named William Murnian, did not want the police to use weapons. In fact, as he is quoted, the commissioner said, I don't want to see the blood of a single white man shed for these niggers. The police had no power to do anything against this mob. Some of the men cried. Some prayed. But all they could do was await their fate as the mob broke through walls and then pried at bars. Finally, a deadly sentence fell on three of the prisoners. Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, and Isaac McGee. As they were brought out of their cell, they were uh, punched, uh, kicked, spit on, and they were taken up the hill. It was a block from the jail. They clearly knew what was going to happen to them. There's a case that, that is always, uh, I found, poignant and disturbing uh, of a young man. He climbed the light pole in order to get a better look at what was going on. And uh, the mob brought Isaac McGee toward the pole on which he sat at the top, threw a rope to him, and said, uh, tie this on over the top. A lot of times I've, I've wished that I hadn't discovered that particular story, because it continues to plague me 
what if I had been that kid, 18 or 19 year old boy, 1920? I mean, I would like to think I wouldn't do it. And what bothers me is that I cannot say for sure I wouldn't have, given those times. Ah, and I, I anguish about this, I really have for 25 years. In keeping with the tradition of American lynching, the night was consecrated with a photograph. This is a, a striking photo in its horribleness. I mean, these are folks who wanted to get in this picture. The next day, the nightmarish news would spread. The New York Times editorialized, the Chicago papers, and there were a number of, and the Duluth paper itself editorialized against the mob activity. But there were papers that supported the mob. The most striking thing was a, to me was a comment by a local citizen. His comment was, why all of this fuss? After all, they was just niggers. This opinion seemed to inform how the legal system would regard the murders. The lynch mob, including ringleader Louis Dandino, was let off easy. Incredibly, and despite clear evidence of innocence, the surviving black circus workers were put through an aggressive trial for rape. Meanwhile, in St. Paul, African-American civic leader Nellie Francis led the successful charge for America's first anti-lynching legislation. But in many ways, this was too little, too late. There was a, a fear that, uh, that was pervasive. People left, and in fact, in, uh, in Superior, Wisconsin, the handful of black families that lived in Superior at the time of this were ordered out of town, all of them. As the years passed, the tragedy was pushed out of the community's consciousness. It was also left out of the state's history books. So it was officially a non-incident. In the 60s when I first got here, the air base brought many African Americans. Most of the people in Duluth were just very nice people. Becoming a part of the black community in Duluth meant eventually learning about the city's dark secret. I was probably about uh, 17, and I had this older friend. He took me in and showed me the picture in the back room there. I, I was shocked, really shocked, because I knew things happened like, you know, like that down south, but I, didn't, I just didn't envision anything like that ever happening up here. Then in the mid-70s, a young Duluth writer went looking for a dramatic story and found history. Over time, however, the book sort of took on a life of its own. That's the first edition. Finding out that a lynching took place here uh, was one of those things that uh, changed my life, totally changed my life. Something inside me said, you know, you need to do something about this, and we need to honor them. If you don't deal with your difficult history, then you're not being honest about anything. It was Henry. We just talked about it a lot. Duluth still needs to grow up. He's a doer. Racism is very alive and well. He knows how to get stuff done. After meeting with Heidi, I made a few telephone calls in the community. I was very happy that I could uh, be part of this. You know, there's always struggles, particularly when you come together cross-culturally. Um, but it was a group that, that is very committed. When people say, uh, as they ask all committee people, why are you involved? I sometimes get, I think, a little more emphasis on you. You know, why are you involved? What a beautiful group of people. And then just find a spot to eat. You the Clayton also... Jackson McGee Memorial Committee organized a range of activities to commemorate the victims and celebrate the city's growing diversity. Oh, Moving and what the difference that the diversity project has made. But they even work with students at Duluth Central High to create diversity curriculum based on the buried history of the lynchings. But all along, these neighbors wanted to do something profound and permanent for the young men who were murdered and the community that remained wounded. 
Heidi and Henry saw an opportunity, an empty lot at the infamous intersection of the lynchings, a perfect place for an ambitious memorial. I got the call from Henry Banks, and uh, I asked the same question I think a lot of people ask. Uh, I said, why? You know, why do we want to dredge this up? And if you can convince me that we should be doing this, uh, I'd be happy to, to talk to you about it. And so after that, all of a sudden the mayor was on board. The committee took proposals for a memorial. A pair of artists were selected for their concept that would use words, space, and sculpture to explore history and humanity. Tilt your head just slightly this way. Yeah, that's it. I need these to be people, individuals, each unique and different, and um, that would be best for me to have models. We had to depersonalize these people to lynch them, but we're going to reinvest them with their unique personalities or a unique personality and portray them in a respectful way. Amazing. Making it physical, making it something that is there, it, it makes Duluth a better place. There's no, no doubt in my mind of that. I want to take back that corner. It's got to be taken back. And that's about getting as many people there as were there the first time. Doesn't matter how long it takes. Heidi's hope of balancing the historic weight of the lynch mob with a positive gathering came to be on October 10th, 2003, when thousands of Minnesotans marched to the new memorial. After decades of denial, after years of grassroots work, after months of creation, the memorial was finished, and the healing from the fractured history was continuing. The final speaker at the event was Warren Reed. Because of the book and the committee's work, the Seattle resident had recently learned a dark truth that 83 years before, in the same intersection, his great-grandfather was among the leaders of the lynch mob. It was Louis Dandino. As a long-held family secret, and its deeply buried shame was brought to the surface and unraveled. We will never know the destinies and legacies that these men would have chosen for themselves had they been allowed to make that choice. But I know this. Their existence, however brief and cruelly interrupted, is forever woven into the legacy of my own life. My son will continue to be raised in an environment of tolerance, understanding, and humility, now with even more pertinence than before. Where does the black experience in Minnesota begin? And then that's when we found the houses. Tribal historian Jim Jones has found clues on the shores of Leech Lake. This may have been the site of a trading post of the famous black fur trader named George Bonga. In a village near the confluence of Lake Superior and the St. Louis River, an Ojibwe woman married Pierre Banga, a black fur trader. Their children, including son George Banga, born around 1802, would be the first known people of African ancestry born in Minnesota. In the early 1800s, the fur trade was the heartbeat of the heartland. Along with the fur trapping Native Americans and the fur companies, there were the legendary voyageurs. Engagés, voyageurs, were basically the truck drivers of the fur trade. They paddled the canoes, they hauled the goods, they built the posts, they did the hunting, they did all the, the labor. Known for songs as colorful as their dress, the voyageurs drove the area's culture and commerce. After attending school in Montreal, George Banga began work in the fur trade like his father, Pierre Banga, and his grandfather, Jean Banga, before him. He knew how to get around in the country, where the best routes were, where you could portage from one place to another, where a good place for a, for a post would be. He was a huge man, I mean, big, <laughs> by even contemporary standards. And 
a powerful man. There's one account that he portage 700 pounds. They were human machines and men who were strong, who put up with hardships day in and day out, were valued. And most of them wore out pretty fast. It was a lifestyle that used people up. But not Bonga, although his longevity in the business was due to more than just brute strength. He had to be a somewhat of an intellect. Um, one, he was very skilled in languages. He was um, educated in Montreal. Um, so he did not come to the frontier um, without skills, without intellectual attributes. He was an entrepreneur as well. In 1838, George Bonga received his license to trade. As a trader clerk for the American Fur Company, Bonga eventually ran a post on Leech Lake, where he would have a home for the rest of his life. The experience of the French Indian Métis and the few early black settlers suggests that, in these early days of Minnesota, race was often irrelevant. This was the frontier, which meant the survival was key. And in a frontier, you don't have the luxury to discriminate. And so it was possible to find all kinds of, of, of roles that black people could fill and uh, all kinds of identities that they could acquire for themselves. Native people identified anybody who didn't live in their way, whether they're Dakota or Ojibwe people, as white people. Bonga's part of that as, as in his work as a, as a trader. He claims to, he and another man claim to have been the first two white men in the country in the area they were trading with the Ojibwe, but not, not as a white man racially, but as a participant in, in European culture. So the notion of, of color and race is fluid. George Bonga Mule Ojibwa. His mother was Ojibwa, an Ojibwa wife. George, like his brother Stephen, used this multicultural background to work as a diplomat translator. Both the Bonga brothers' signatures can be found on major treaties between the United States and sovereign tribes. And that's no easy place to be, um, because you had to be trusted by both sides. Bonga's Cultural Balancing Act did strain his relations with his mother's people. In 1837, the trading post of William Atkins was robbed. Atkins' son was killed in the raid. A member of the Pillager Ojibwe was the prime suspect. George Bonga tracked the accused killer through the Minnesota winter for days. He finally captured the suspect and brought him to the authorities at Fort Snelling. After his return to his trading post on Leech Lake, Bonga mentioned the tension he encountered. The Indians say, if Chigawaskung is missing, they will set fire to my store and break my canoes from my part. I don't think they are really in earnest in these words. Despite this, Bonga's standing with the Ojibwe remained good. He eventually started a family at Leech Lake. George married into the Leech Lake band. He took a wife from the Anigam community here. He accepted them. They accepted him. We find in history there was a certain element of trust that seemed to exist between native peoples and people of African descent. The black pioneer gained the respect of many of Minnesota's white founding fathers, and Elder Bonga used his legendary status to advocate for Native Americans who were being pushed further into the realm of the reservation. In the late 1860s, letters he wrote to government officials reveal his contempt for corrupt government Indian agents. Respected sir, I am really sorry to have to say that I have lost all hopes in Major Clark. It is a disgrace to the government to have such an agent. I have not hesitated to make known to you my opinion in the matter of great importance to the Indians and the people of the frontier hoping that the Great Spirit will so guide our ways that we may meet again and have another good campfire talk, I remain yours, George Bonga. I mean, he was a man of substance. He was one of the forefathers of the state, one of the pioneers. Bonga died at Leech Lake in 1874. He and his siblings had several children who continued to have experiences that spoke to their unique heritage. George's daughter, Susie Bonga, had been a rising leader among the Ojibwe women of Leech Lake. But white racism towards blacks began to influence some Native Americans, which presented obstacles for Susie Bonga. Photos of son William Bonga, one as deputy, 
the other's tribal delegate to Washington, seemed to capture the bongos' cultural crossroads. Two hundred years after the birth of George Bonga, conversations on a genealogy website showed the descendants of this pioneer family are still pondering their unique background. Along with their living legacy, namesake landmarks with variations on the spelling of the family name dot the land in Cass County. To me, that's his, this is his place. Jim Jones and others continue to make discoveries that help unravel the story of the Bongas and Minnesota's pre-territorial history. Yeah, something like that come over. But on this day, the Pillager Band member made another discovery, a brilliant rainbow that appeared over the rough waters of Leech Lake, a colorful connection between two far-off points, just like George Bonga. On the evening of July 11, 1902, a grand banquet was held at the Armory on the campus of the University of Minnesota. It was the annual meeting of the National Afro-American Council, attended by historic figures such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells Barnett, and Booker T. Washington, the greatest gathering of African-American leaders ever to occur in Minnesota. The event would also be historic in that it would highlight a growing rift among black leaders on how to best uplift the race in the new century. In the middle of this clash was the man who brought the event in Minnesota, Frederick Lamar McGee. McGee was a participant in this great American story, really, of the post-emancipation generation searching for what role black Americans were going to have in the country. And all that drama being played out nationally was being played out here. Fred McGee was born a slave in Mississippi in 1861. By 1886, McGee had risen up from slavery, found education, married, and joined the most prestigious African-American law firm in the city of Chicago. Three years later, he had been lured from the black Mecca of Chicago to the tiny black community in St. Paul. The community had reached um, a critical mass where it might be important to have black professionals come in and provide services. F.L. McGee was one of those that was recruited. I, he had a law degree, uh, was encouraged to come up here and practice. And so in June of 1889, Frederick McGee became the first African-American lawyer to practice in Minnesota. The man who brought McGee to St. Paul, newspaper editor John Quincy Adams, introduced the attorney in the pages of his paper, The Appeal. But the mainstream press was just as interested in the dynamic young lawyer. First of all, he was a curiosity. Second, he was a handsome fellow and very articulate. And naturally, reporters are drawn to that. The confident courtroom lawyer took on a series of sensational defenses and won, much to the delight of the black community. The winning of this case is a triumph for our able attorney. All parties to the case were of the Anglo-Saxon race, which makes the victory of Lawyer McGee the more striking. Fred was notorious. He would scrap with other lawyers. They, they used to say, not so much that Fred liked to fight as he was unwilling to back down from any attempts to, um, to disparage his character or his uh, legal abilities, but Fred was a race man. Like almost all African Americans in the late 19th century, McGee belonged to the party of Lincoln. In 1892, the Republicans honored Fred McGee by naming him an at-large delegate to its national convention held that year in Minneapolis. But when European ethnic groups in the party pointed out the number of votes gained by patronizing their community, the Republicans turned their backs on the black leader. Well, they dropped him, and of course, with that, McGee dropped them. <laughs> and uh, so he left the Republican Party and became Minnesota's leading Democrat. While it was questioned at the time, McGee's party switch was prophetic. Republicans have proven themselves beyond redemption. The Democratic Party show me every consideration that I have asked for. 
more than any other Negro now enjoys at the hands of the Republican Party of this state, or will for many a year to come. At about the same time, McGee was making another unorthodox decision. He converted to Catholicism. The Catholic religion teaches and requires one common brotherhood. To the Negro, the Catholic Church means a shelter in the mighty storm. This perspective was influenced by Archbishop John Ireland, whose progressive stand on African-American equality led to the creation of St. Paul's historic black Catholic parish, St. Peter Claver. Among the incorporators, signing their names on the papers were John Ireland and Fred McGee. Whether it was party politics or religion, what seemed to be important to McGee was what it meant for his people. The early activist's legal license was his other weapon of choice. McGee filed a number of local civil rights lawsuits. In 1891, before Plessy versus Ferguson, he took on a case with national implications where he brought suit against separate but equal laws in Tennessee. Unfortunately, he and his allies couldn't afford the long distance case, but McGee was right. This was the legal approach that would eventually end American segregation, but not for another half century. So he was a sort of prophet in the wilderness trying to get done what the NAACP Legal Defense Fund did, gosh, in the 1940s. While McGee's profile was on the rise nationally, he continued to put down roots locally. Well, one of the things is um, what a thorough Minnesotan he became. He participated in the arts, he appeared in plays, he supports charities. In 1892, he and his wife Maddie adopted a two-year-old orphan while in New York. McGee himself had lost his parents when he was 13. The leader's interest in this issue made him an active board member for the Christmas Attic's house in St. Paul. I believe in organizations. Heart and soul, I believe. McGee's role in early civil rights organizations led to the great gathering that occurred in the Twin Cities in 1902. He managed to make Minnesota the site of that year's annual meeting of the National Afro-American Council. Success for the St. Paul meeting would be the participation of Booker T. Washington, founder of the Tuskegee Institute and a leader who had the ear of U.S. presidents. McGee desperately wanted Washington at the meeting in St. Paul. The statesman obliged the emerging leader from Minnesota and attended. As the business of the convention proceeded, McGee and his allies soon realized one of the reasons for Washington's preeminence. The Bookerites were calculating throughout the conference and maneuvered him into control over the organization. And so McGee finds himself blindsided, completely politically outmaneuvered, and it's by his idol, Booker T. Washington. Washington's tactics and his conservative approach to black advancement frustrated another emerging leader, Harvard scholar W.E.B. Du Bois. McGee and Du Bois would become friends and allies and would provide a new direction for the new century. McGee and Du Bois sensed that this, this break was coming, the opportunity was there. His connections with Du Bois led to a discussion in 1905 about an alternate civil rights organization, which later became known as the Niagara Movement. In the past year, the work of the Negro hater has flourished in the land. Against this, the Niagara Movement eternally protests. We claim for ourselves every single right that belongs to a free-born American. Later, the Niagara Movement melded into what was, would become the NAACP. Co-founding America's most important civil rights organization was one of the many contributions of Frederick McGee. For all of his efforts, in 1911, a dinner was held in his honor where he graciously responded to his community. When the lips, now speaking, are laid in the grave, that my brothers will gather themselves as you are gathered tonight and say, he lived, tried to be right, tried to help the race, and in trying to be right and trying to help the race, he died. Unfortunately, McGee again was prophetic. His time was short. A year later, he died of an infection at age 52. I 
there wasn't enough room at St. Peter Claver for the memorial service. There had to be another one. It was a great outpouring of eloquence, the likes of which probably rarely seen. I really, I think of uh, Hubert Humphrey's memorial service as a similar sort of civic event. People recognized to a certain degree that um, a man the likes of which would not be seen again had been lost. But as a, a memorial and testimony to his professional work, the St. Paul branch of the NAACP was organized in 1913. When Minnesotans recruited Frederick McGee to St. Paul, they were just looking for a lawyer. What they got was a leader who was ahead of his time. Among the next generation of black attorneys that carried on McGee's mission was Minneapolis activist Brown Smith. In his eulogy to McGee, Smith seemed to capture the lasting promise of the late attorney. He was a race man in all that the term implies. I know of nothing that would inspire a little Negro boy more than to hold up before his face a picture of Fred McGee. Pictures hold power. This 2003 exhibit of photography by and about Somali youth in Minnesota was one of the first times the newcomers presented themselves and their lives in pictures. Decades ago, Minnesota's Gordon Parks went from being a volunteer photographer with the Minneapolis black newspaper, The Spokesman, to being Life Magazine's first black photographer and beyond, using the camera as a way to see the beauty and join the battle. But Gordon Parks was not St. Paul's first celebrated black photographer. May 5th, 1899. One of the best examples of progressiveness, ability, and business capacity is that of Mr. Harry Shepard, the photographer. Within the last decade, he has arisen from almost obscurity to the position of leading and most popular photographer of the city. Before the turn of the century, when the Plessy versus Ferguson decision made segregation the law of the land, Harry Shepard made a name for himself as an activist photographer with clients as varied as his skills. Well, in the 1880s and 90s, there were about 30 other studios just in St. Paul that he was competing with. So it was a very competitive business. His business was right near 7th and Wabasha, the heart of the business community. He wasn't off somewhere on a side street. He was really on Main Street. Harry Shepard's pictures are worth a thousand words about Minnesota's people and its past. This elegant portrait of two elegant women belies their dramatic story. Snana, wife of Chief Good Thunder, and Mary Schwant Schmidt were girls during the Dakota Uprising of 1862. Mary was captured, her life threatened by a black outlaw named Godfrey, who fought with the Dakota. But a young Snana helped Mary make it out of the uprising alive. So he posed them in his studio, and it's a very touching photograph. Shepard photographed everyday people for every occasion. His artistry earned the ultimate praise in Minnesota, a State Fair gold medal. He won two gold medals at the Minnesota State Fair, 1891 and 1892. Photographers would compete to win these gold medals at the State Fair, and then they would emboss them on their cabinet views to show that they'd actually won. With the gold medal adorning his prints, Shepard's lens focused in on the state's who's who, including political gadfly Ignatius Donnelly and even the entire 1903 state legislature. But Shepard's crossover clientele came at a cost. Some in the black community grumbled that he gave preference to white customers. John Quincy Adams, editor of The Appeal, leapt to Shepard's defense. Some malicious people have started a rumor that colored people are not given as much attention as other patrons, which is a base fabrication springing from the hearts of that class of people who cannot bear to see other people prosper. He never didn't advertise himself as being African American. It was clear that he was part of the African American community, and it was, it was brave to do that. Regardless of color and customers, Shepard was, to use a term from the times, a true race man. 
He was involved in early civil rights organizations in the Twin Cities. On more than one occasion, African-American icon Booker T. Washington stood before Shepard's camera. Harry Shepard realized his art could aid his activism. He has made a very thorough study of the history of the Afro-American in this country. The picture as a whole is titled Our Unsung Heroes, or the men whose names have been forgotten. In what sounds like Shepard's masterpiece, he created a dramatic photo collage of black struggle and progress. He and the state's first black legislator, J. Frank Wheaton, toured the nation selling the powerful posters and doing slideshow lectures on race issues. Even without being able to see the collage, it's clear it made an impact. The picture is large and very handsome, besides being of such historic interest, and it should adorn the walls of every Afro-American in the country. It must be seen to be fully appreciated. Shepard's powerful pictures caught the eye of emerging black scholar W.E.B. Du Bois and others as they prepared an exhibit of African-American achievements since emancipation. The display would be part of the American presence at the 1900 Paris Exposition. The appointment of Mr. Shepard is quite an honor and a compliment to his artistic ability. While on location in the South, Harry Shepard did more than take pictures of Southern blacks. He talked to them. And his radical tone was too much for the government-funded project at a time when violent segregation was tightening its grip on America. He had to be let go, much to the chagrin of the Minneapolis Afro-American advance. We regret that Mr. Shepard has lost that fat position. Conservatism ought always to be the watchword of the lucky. Shepard shot back in the pages of the appeal. If the Afro-American papers of this country are satisfied to fill their columns with frivolous matters while a portion of our brothers and sisters in the South are being kept in perpetual bondage, that is their business. I work along my own lines. If I fail, I am alone. I ask neither advice nor sympathy. A few years after the controversy over the Paris Exposition, Harry Shepard had moved on. For early photographers, barnstorming was a part of the business. Accounts from Minnesota's black press mention him working in Chicago, then in Seattle where he published a newspaper. I think that that kind of shows that he really did want to have a voice. I think he wanted to, to speak out and uh, establish himself as a spokesperson. In the years preceding World War I, Harry Shepard's story starts to fade like an unprotected old photo. It's not clear what became of him. Fortunately, a few of Harry Shepard's pictures remain. These are vivid insights into Minnesota's past and the story of this black entrepreneur, artist, and activist who, like his work, is a portrait of progress. When J. Frank Wheaton became Minnesota's first black legislator in 1898, he served his term in an aging state house. A new capital was in the works. The building's design was awarded to emerging architect Cass Gilbert, who would go on to create many of America's great edifices. Gilbert's vision was that the structure would be of an Italian Renaissance style and would possess a quiet and dignified character. These traits also describe some notable African Americans at the Capitol, quiet and dignified Renaissance men whose lives would be intertwined with Minnesota's most important building. Cass Gilbert's plans for the new capital stirred controversy when he demanded to use marble from Georgia. Along with the marble came black workers from Georgia, men like Mason Benjamin Stevens, who knew how to work the stone. The construction of the capital also brought north a prolific stonecutter named Cassaville Bullard. Cassaville told family he had been called to work on the Capitol. Whether he meant literally or figuratively, the Memphis native with extensive training in stone cutting and brick laying seemed well suited for the project. While laying stone on the Renaissance Revival State House, Cassaville was settling down in St. Paul. He purchased land in the Como Heights edition. Then his wife, whose name was Addison, came up from Memphis and helped him build this house. She held a lamp so there would be light after he came home from work, so he'd work on the house at night. 
and age of 32, she died and left 10 children. They wanted to take us away and put us in a home, but he said, no, I promised my wife I was gonna keep them all together. And he did, yes, and I was the youngest. <laughs> It would be cozy times. He made it cozy for us after our mother died. As Bullard put stones into place, his thoughts must have drifted to the future and how the dealings of democracy within these walls would affect his children and grandchildren. Cassaville Bullard's skills and certainly his work on the Capitol made him a highly sought craftsman. From the turn of the century through the post-war period, he had a hand in the construction of some of the best buildings in the Twin Cities. As an African-American, Bullard's membership in the local number one bricklayers and stonecutters union was rare and crucial for him getting work. By working on the historic Highland Park water tower, Cassaville Bullard rendered in stone the designs of St. Paul's brilliant black city architect, Clarence Cap Wigington. Like Wigington, Cassaville's work wasn't well known throughout the Twin Cities, but Bullard was noticed by an African-American boy named James Millsap, who watched as the black stonecutter helped build the Ober Boys Club building. Today, bricklayers use tools like brick saws to cut and fit the brick. Not Mr. Bullard. He took a brick hammer and knocked off the corners of the brick and laid them. When he finished, it was impeccable. There were no African-American superintendents or foremen, and he encouraged me to strive for those positions. James Millsap would go on to own and operate a construction company, while Bullard set yet another cornerstone for the future. The stonecutter helped install the Vision of Peace statue and did other work on St. Paul City Hall, where over a half century later, his grandson, Arlie's son, Jerry Blakey, would serve as one of the few black council members in the city's history. While Cassaville Bullard and other black masons helped lay the Capitol stone, in over a hundred years, only a few blacks have served in its chambers. Despite this woeful record, African Americans were represented at the Capitol since the day it opened. For over 50 years, Billy Williams worked as an aide in the governor's reception room to 14 different governors. When he was a boy, Billy was the host at another historic building. He and his brother were pages at an 1880 St. Paul Winter Carnival, where he greeted visitors to a magnificent ice palace near the site where the Capitol would be built. But baseball was Billy's real joy. By the turn of the century, Billy emerged as one of the state's best players. William's charm was as strong as his bat, earning him the nickname Gentleman Bill. Dear sir, kindly name your lowest terms to play in Toronto during the coming season, and you shall have an immediate reply. Billy caught the eye of a number of scouts. But to play in the best pro leagues, Billy would have to pass himself off as Native American. He did not abandon his race. He said, I'm black, and that's it, and he wouldn't play for them. The year was 1904. Minnesota's new governor, John Johnson, would soon take office in the new capital. Johnson consoled Billy on his tough decision and made him an offer. And he said, uh, I got a job for you as executive aide. You go up there and you set up my office for me. And so that's how he got started there. His official title was messenger and aide, but Billy Williams was often a kind of unelected influence for African Americans at a time when Minnesota's elected officials were as white as the capital's Georgia marble. In 1920, a chill was sent through Minnesota when three black men were lynched in front of a mob of thousands in Duluth. Also in the early 20s, the Ku Klux Klan reared its ugly hooded head in Minnesota. In 1913, a bill was introduced that would ban interracial marriages. Billy, the child of a black father and white mother, offered himself to legislators as proof that there was nothing to fear in an interracial America. The racist bill was defeated, the Klan's public activities were restricted, and anti-lynching laws were passed. In each case, the Capitol's quiet black spokesman made a real difference on decision makers. 
During the Depression, the tension and unrest of the nation and the state flowed into the Casota Stone Halls of the Capitol, as Billy noted in his journal. January 28, 1937. Lumberjack strike committee here all day. Governor seems to be equal to the task. April 5, 1937. Several hundred farmers from all parts of the state stormed the Capitol regarding tax matters. February 4, 1937. Many people wait all day to see the governor. Almost impossible to handle the crowds. Billy's work as unofficial ambassador introduced him to a wide range of people, including Minnesota's black movie star, Hilda Sims, and Ethiopian emperor, Haile Selassie. He greeted everyday folks as well as the famous. In fact, he would meet and greet over a quarter of a million people in his half century in the governor's office. Governors come and governors go, but Billy Williams has remained a heritage to citizens of Minnesota and a monument to his race. So much praise from the white community can raise eyebrows in the African-American community. One of his criticisms uh, that I noted in the book is that he was considered an Uncle Tom by some people. The historic black paper, the Chicago Defender, gave African Americans across the country a sense of William's worth. Billy is six feet of sincere, open-handed friendliness. Governor Olson may run the state, but Billy runs the Capitol. June 28, 1957. Billy Williams closes his desk in the governor's office today for the last time. In 1957, just shy of his 80th birthday, Billy finally retired. The state celebrated the half century of service of Minnesota's assistant governor. For a historic retirement gift, Billy was honored as only Minnesota governors are when they leave the Capitol. He had his portrait painted. Theodore Soner, who painted portraits of governors Youngdahl and Ty, rendered Billy on canvas. Billy Williams, who never married, lived with his niece. At her home in 1963, Billy passed away. For decades, Billy's portrait, his well-worn desk, and much of his story collected dust in storage. Also chipped away from Minnesota's memory was stonecutter Cassaville Bullard. How many knew of the black hands that helped shape the Capitol and other buildings? In the mid-90s, Cassaville's youngest daughter decided to right this wrong. She campaigned to have the family house and Bullard's story added to the National Register of Historic Places. The capital's famous focal point, the Quadriga, represents the progress of the state. Less familiar icons like Williams and Bullard are also great symbols of progress. Bullard's daughter says her father helped set the gilded statue in place. She proudly shares these stories from the Galtier home, just blocks from the Capitol, where her amazing father's work is always within view. In the time between the World Wars, Harlem, New York was the center of a black renaissance of art, intellect, and activism. There was a new outlook and optimism that shone from the brown faces that populated Harlem's brownstones. What could be further from Lenox Avenue than Anoka, Minnesota? But this tiny river town, as well as the North Shore Port of Duluth, produced two important participants in the Black Renaissance. Here at home, in Harlem, and beyond, Anna Arnold Hedgeman and Ethel Ray Nance were true Renaissance women. Anna Arnold Hedgeman is a very, very important figure for understanding aspects of the Harlem Renaissance that uh, haven't been fully explored. She and Ethel Ray Nance played crucial roles in the organizational structures that made the Harlem Renaissance possible. Both women were born in 1899. Both had quiet beginnings in almost all white towns, and both were influenced by strong fathers named William. Two decades before the gondola-style aerial bridge would rise over Duluth, Ethel Ray Nance's father put down roots in the port town. In the 1880s, William Ray was among the few blacks working in Duluth. He met and married Ethel's mother, a Swedish immigrant. But all of my playmates were white at that time. In an oral history interview recorded in 1974, Ethel Ray Nance recalled the tension her father felt in Duluth in the early part of the century. They had shown that they were not friendly. 
but he was determined that we were going to learn about the Negro race and all of our trials. And he seemed to want to, to, to make us aware. Along with this sense of awareness, Ethel's upbringing in the port town gave her a strong work ethic, but she left the North Shore in search of broader horizons. In the Twin Cities, Ethel Ray Nance worked in a range of social service positions. She worked for W. Gertrude Brown at the Phyllis Wheatley House when the settlement was the center of black life in Minneapolis. She was one of the city's first black female police officers, and her secretarial skills helped her become one of the first black stenographers at the legislature in 1923. Black newspapers throughout the Midwest made note of Ethel's presence at the state capitol. Job offers poured in. This eventually led her to Harlem in the mid-twenties, where she did administrative work for the Urban League's Opportunity magazine. While Ethel was growing up on the shores of Lake Superior, Anna Arnold was coming of age where the Mississippi meets the Rum River. William Arnold decided the best place to raise his family was Anoka, Minnesota. One census report says he was a lecturer. Another census report said he was an editing a newspaper. So he evidently was very well educated. While the large black family faced some prejudice, Anna's autobiographies describe the town as a good fit for her father's emphasis on education. In my small town, teachers and parents knew each other, and teachers were required to live in the town in order to understand it. We had uh, women doctors at the turn of the century. We had women in business. We had one of the earliest women superintendents uh, for a school district. So these women would have been around the community when Anna was growing up. Anna would join Anoka's notable women when she became one of the first African Americans to attend Hamlin University in St. Paul. Qualified, concerned professors made education at Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota a stimulating and enriching experience. In the early 20s, the gifted student was finishing her education degree but St. Paul wouldn't allow her to student teach in the city's schools. One has access to education, to higher education, in a school of tremendous resources and accomplished faculty and so forth, but one is largely barred socially from full participation in the life of the campus. At Hamlin, Anna met discrimination with dignity. She also met the father of the Harlem Renaissance, W.E.B. Du Bois. After her contact with Du Bois and the desire to see the larger world, she began to uh, pursue what Du Bois later called worlds of color. Anna began teaching in the South, but the Minnesotan was shocked by the stark racism of Dixie. She committed herself to a life of fighting inequality in America. In the mid-twenties, Anna's race work led her to Harlem. Ethel Ray Nance was there at this time, too. One of the things that Anna Arnold Hedgeman and uh, Ethel Ray Nance have in common is that it was uh, their skills as stenographers, as secretaries, that initially got them work in these uh, again, newly created racial uplift organizations. For Ethel Ray Nance, her employer, Opportunity Magazine, was aptly titled as she found herself in the midst of black history. She recollected repeatedly about the apartment that she shared with uh, a couple of other young black women that became one of the, uh, the salons of the Harlem Renaissance. These African-American artists and activists were also friends and neighbors. Du Bois himself looked out for the underpaid workers. Dr. Du Bois, by the way, used to take us to dinner. We were only paid once a month. So toward the end of the month, usually that, that last week, we would call him and ask him how he was, Dr. Du Bois, if he was in town. And he'd say, I presume you're hungry. And then he would take us out to dinner. He was very nice about that. I think he got quite a kick out of us. It, it was a feeling, I've, I've never felt better than I did. I really felt that anything could be accomplished there in, in New York. But by the late 20s, ailing parents would bring Ethel Ray Nance back to Duluth. Anna Arnold would remain in New York. She ended up as a principal um, organizer, director in the Harlem branch of the YWCA. Paul Robeson, Du Bois, Langston Hughes stream through these places. You get a sense of the kind of excitement and the kind of opening up that the Harlem uh, YWCA provided for her. Anna Arnold, who married Merritt Hedgeman in 1933, continued to break through glass ceilings in East Coast government and social work. 
At times, she wondered if a woman from a sleepy Minnesota parish could be a black leader in the world's greatest city. Anna was more than able. She supervised depression relief in New York slums. She directed the National Council for Fair Employment Practices. She represented the U.S. State Department and worked with the U.N. She was the first African-American woman appointed to a New York mayor's cabinet, and she would become one of the founders of NOW, the National Organization for Women. America has bottled up the Negro. Anna Arnold Hedgeman's years of social service and political work made her a natural leader with the growing civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. But she met resistance from men. Every interview I had, I was asked if I could preside over a group of men. My answer was, I thought it was entirely possible. Men have begun to mature. Anna was always able to disarm with charm. But her frustration with the movement's focus on male leadership came to a head while working on the historic March on Washington. She was the only woman on the Central Planning Committee where she learned that women were left off the list of speakers. In light of the role of Negro women in the struggle for freedom, it is incredible that no woman should appear as a speaker at the historic March on Washington meeting at the Lincoln Memorial. I would like to make the following suggestion, that a Negro woman makes a brief statement and presents the other heroines. I hope that my memorandum will receive careful consideration. The men simply had no choice but to follow Anna's orders. What she did in the uh, backstage of the March on Washington uh, was a kind of, uh, of leading position for other black women who would take similar stances over the course of the next decade. Ethel Ray Nance continued her backstage efforts as well, including work with black colleges, a role in establishing the United Nations, and leadership in the San Francisco NAACP she spent the remainder of her life in California. We understand much better now that these movements really built on organizational structures that black women um, had played uh, uh, the leading roles uh, in developing. Ethel Ray Nance and Anna Arnold Hedgeman gave new meaning to the term woman's work. These daughters of the prairie overcame limits to become leaders, building from their beginnings in Minnesota. In my small town, there was no talk of money or profit or competition, only stress on the development of God-given talent for service in the world. But one day, this nation will rise up. In 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered one of the most powerful oratories in American history. It was the climax of the historic March on Washington. But the day was much more than the I Have a Dream speech. For participants, including a group from Minnesota, the March on Washington was a monumental organizational achievement, a high point for the movement that led up to it, and an unforgettable moment of motivation for the bittersweet years that would follow. Minnesotans are also staunch supporters of three big annual shows, Winter Carnival. In 1958, Minnesota celebrated 100 years as a state. But more important than that, as part of the centennial, African-American journalist Carl Rowan was held up as a symbol of the strides blacks had made here. Minnesotans had made it obvious that racial injustice weighed heavily on the conscience of the people. In many state. ways, Rowan was right. And that Minnesota had made real progress toward equality and opportunity to through the efforts of Minneapolis mayor and senator Hubert Humphrey who worked closely with black activists like newspaper publisher Cecil Newman and labor leader Nellie Stone Johnson. The cities of this rich and lovely land are friendly cities. They gave me a ticket to Minneapolis, and that was February 1948. Matthew Little had come north to find a better life, but he soon found out that Minnesota had its own brand of Jim Crow. I heard that there were some openings for firefighters. And I said, boy, that will do, that I had settled for that. Little, a college graduate and a physically fit Army vet, knew he had done well in the multi-part test. He even broke a record in the physical portion of the exam. But he couldn't outrun intolerance. They failed him. Matt Little confronted one of the testers. And I asked him, just how could you do that? The civil service tester admitted to the race-based projection of Little's application. 
this was one of dozens of indignities that he suffered in the Twin Cities. It made me become active in the civil rights uh, movement. Matt Little in Minnesota, Rosa Parks in Montgomery. By the mid-50s, blacks were fighting back. In the summer of 63, the growing movement had led to an emerging but vulnerable civil rights bill that was taking shape in Washington. To push for its passage, an array of activists and organizations called for the ultimate demonstration, a massive march on Washington. Matthew Little would become the chair of the Minnesota contingent. The national planners required that marchers represent a remarkable range of race, religion, region, and class. So each state had to pull together a surprisingly diverse group of participants. This was just one of the many challenges that had to be met, with the march date just weeks away. In the press, there was a lot of indication that you're able to get 250 civil rights people there in Washington. There'd be all kinds of riots and everything else. Even Minnesota's progressive politicians had worries about the march. There was a lot of apprehension, but finally they all, uh, they came around. In addition to fielding a diverse group and cultivating political support, the participants also had to agree to the key strategy of the sit-ins and freedom rides, nonviolence. Some leaders in the local movement decided they couldn't promise total nonviolence, so they didn't go. The fact is, after years of direct action, activists had proven their commitment to peaceful protest, but Washington officials were still worried, so a tough requirement was placed on the event. One of the other requirements were that the whole 250, all the markets, would have to be out of Washington by sundown. Challenges were met, funds were raised, a million details were dealt with. Finally, Minnesota was ready to march. It's my regret that I didn't get to uh, go to the march on Washington. But after I got off from work that night, I thought, well, I'll drive out to the airport anyhow. We had the old airport then, and it had that open roof. And here down on the field was this little tiny plane. And I felt like it was just carrying all the hopes for the future. When the plane finally took off, we all just automatically reached out and took one another's hands, and we sang, We Shall Overcome. And it was just a really, really beautiful time. The morning of August 28, 1963, Minnesota marchers reached D.C. When the Minnesotans reached the mall, they joined a quarter of a million like-minded Americans. Interestingly, there were Minnesotans on the other side of the stage as well. Roy Wilkins had gone from the St. Paul neighborhood of Rondo to the leadership of the National NAACP. He was among the organizers of the event. There was Whitney Young, a University of Minnesota graduate and executive director of the National Urban League, and Dr. Anna Arnold Hedgeman, a product of Anoka, Minnesota and Hamlin University. She was the lone woman among the national organizers. The day's program featured a progression of presenters representing the past and future of the movement. And then Dr. King got up, and it was um, this hush that just captured the entire 250,000 people. And boy, it was the most uh, captivating thing you've ever seen in your life. A picture that I'll, I'll, I'll always remember. It was so dramatic, and, and it had such meaning. It was so simple. The message was so simple. The dream that we all had. During their charter flight back to the Twin Cities, the Minnesotans were sky high. There was a microphone on the, uh, on the plane that they allowed me to use. And I asked if everybody feels like I do. And they say, yes, <laughs> you know, everybody, yes. Well, this can't possibly be the end. 
The group formed the March on Washington Committee and successfully pressed every one of the state's elected officials to support the crucial civil rights legislation. In addition to national efforts, Minnesota's activists also made real change here at home. This button had been sold to raise money for the march and other civil rights causes. It became the symbol of the movement, a black and white beacon that simply and strikingly captured the mood of the March on Washington. Then in 1967, Dr. King came to the Twin Cities. King was now hearing the call of other causes like the Poor People's Campaign and the anti-war movement. So this is where we are today, moving to a new phase of the struggle. I can remember grabbing a sweater, whatever, and dashing out there and uh, being so proud of him. The courage of the man could never be disputed, and I felt that that day. The speech included a familiar finish. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you. A year later, King was killed. The fight would continue, sometimes in the street, but much of the esprit and essence of the civil rights movement died with King. And from all the points of the compass, we came to march. 35 Washington years after King appeared on campus, Concord, there was another Concord. eventful gathering at the university. For as long as Minnesotans who were a part of the March on Washington came together for a 40-year reunion. My name is Marge Wayne Turner. The march started in my living room after watching the water hoses and dogs on the TV every night. One evening I said to my husband, I had seen a little blurb in the paper about the march, and I said, I think we should go to that. He said, okay. Well, then I didn't know what to do. So I called Dr. Tom Johnson, who lived across the alley from me. She said, I'll write a check for $6,000 to charter the plane, and you guys get the money together by Monday, because I got to cover the check. <laughs> <laughs> and by Sunday afternoon, we had $6,000 to pay for the plane. Well, I will let you know, I have my canceled check <laughs> received it. I wrote you the first bad check connected with it. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it did go through. Inspired by the March on Washington, I became the um, whip for the Democratic Study Group when the civil rights bills came to the floor of the House of Representatives, and we kept track of everybody who walked down the aisle to cast their vote. That led, in a few years, to another reform to require that there be a recorded vote, and that changed the whole process of the United States Congress. To me, the whole civil rights struggle is the emblem of the America that I think about when I'm proud to be an American. I'd like to share with you how the March on Washington influenced my children. Some years ago, when they called me downstairs one night to tell me how I had influenced their lives. Now, let me tell you something. If your kids do that for you before you kick off, you have received a wonderful blessing. Yes, I... We got down to Washington, the thing that really surprised me and, and just left me in tears from the moment that we stepped out to do the march was the constant singing of We Shall Overcome. And we we're all holding hands. We need to re-engage ourselves and recommit ourselves to what is right and just. When you stand for something, you have to be consistent, committed, and determined. And we are not finished yet. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Support for North Star, Minnesota's Black Pioneers, is provided in part by St. Paul Travelers, providing property and casualty insurance products and services for businesses and individuals. And by Jostens, because life is a circle filled with starts and finishes, beginnings and endings. For over a century, Jostens has helped people celebrate, reward, and remember the greatest moments of their lives. Support for North Star is also made possible by Otto Bremer Foundation, Stairstep Foundation, RBC Dane Rauscher, General Mills Foundation, Archie D. and Bertha H. Walker Foundation, West, a Thompson business, and Education Minnesota's Foundation for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, with additional funding by Education partners for North Star include Minneapolis Public Schools, Northwest Suburban Integration School District, West Metro Education Program, and East Metro Integration District.